Appreciate the choir's number there for us this morning. 
Memorial Day is a special day, and let me just remind you of what the days are. Two weeks ago, the, I believe it was on the 16th, if I remember correctly, it was Armed Forces Day, as when we honor those who are currently serving. Um, Veterans Day in November are, is the time we honor those who have served and are still living. And we've got several veterans in our church, and we are thankful for them and for their service to our country. But Memorial Day is not for either one of those groups. Memorial Day is for those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice. And they are those who have laid down their life for our country. Uh, you could probably talk to some of our veterans in here, and they would <clears throat> speak of those who they may be served with <clears throat> who did not come home. Um, I had a request from a friend of mine <clears throat> this week who, whose brother who served in the Middle East uh, uh, two terms, and he was uh, on his uh, C-131 to come back. I believe that's what it was, a C-131. Does that sound right, Brother Lance? Uh, on his transport to come back home whenever his company got called back to go back in to the Middle East. Um, but because he was already on the plane, he wasn't able to go, and so the driver, he was the driver of the Humvee for his group. Um, they went back out, and the seat he was supposed to be sitting in, that Humvee was hit, ran over an ID, uh, IED, and the, that man was killed along with several others of, the, of his group. And he lives with that um, guilt that he wasn't where he was supposed to be and that it should have been him. And our veterans who deal with that, they think of those who have paid the cost. And, and I understand those things, but today is the day to honor those men and women who gave their lives for us to have freedom. And so as you think about that, and tomorrow, as tomorrow's Memorial Day, as you go out and you get the grills going, you flip your burgers and you have the, the time, and I have a good time with family, and please do rejoice that we have freedom. But don't forget about those who have laid down their lives and that everything that we have is built upon the blood of those who laid down their lives. And so don't forget what Memorial Day is all about. That's what Memorial, is all, Memorial Day is about, is to remember those who have made the sacrifices for us for liberty and for freedom. But also, there is a greater battle than a battle for freedom. And that is the battle on the spiritual battlefield, if you will. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul, as he is writing his last letter to Timothy, he encourages him here with this verse. He says, Thou therefore, in verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The ministry can be difficult at times. The ministry can sometimes punch you real good uh, to the point to where you want to quit. Um, uh, there's a number of, of young men that I went to college with that prepared for the ministry, and, and a number of them have taken some pretty good hits, and a number of them are no longer in the ministry. And it's to say nothing against them at all because we don't understand the spiritual PTSD, if you will, that they have endured. Uh, but it takes a it takes a lot of strength spiritually to endure and to stay with it. The Bible tells us over in 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse 5, again Paul writing to Timothy, he says this, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. That is a summation of what every pastor, evangelist, missionary, that's, that's their heart. That's what they want to do is to make foolproof. In other words, do everything that God calls them to do and accomplish it so that at the end they can have verse number seven, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. An effective ministry so that we can have a finishing testimony. Hebrews chapter number 12 then and verse number one, the Bible says this here, and just the first part of the verse, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. A cloud of witnesses is simply those who have gone on. They have run their race. They have finished their race. Um, I've often heard this, that as 
We still draw breath. It is a dangerous thing sometimes to put a lot of stock into uh, those who are still running their race. Uh, and so while we l look at them and we watch those who are ahead of us and we take note of their testimony, we also understand that they are still running and they can still stumble, they can still fall. But this cloud of witnesses the Bible is talking about are those who have finished their course. And we have this witness and the purpose of a witness here is to give us a testimony of what it is to run the race, to finish the course, to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Last August, our pastor finished his course. He ran his race well. For 43, 44 years, or 43 plus years, he was here. He ran the race here. But before he ran the race here at Victory, he ran the race at a lot of other places around. And he faithfully preached the Word of God. He faithfully stood and proclaimed what the Bible says. He faithfully proclaimed the message of salvation. And yeah. Brother Parker was a shining example of what I believe these verses mean, of what they are to endure afflictions, to make full proof of thy ministry, to do the work of an evangelist. I think all of us in here who knew him can attest to that. I believe there are three people in particular in this room who could attest to seeing it not just here at church, but also at home and going back and forth from place to place, piling everybody in the car. You know, I heard the stories of, uh, you know, uh, um, Mrs. Parker picking him up at Brown Shoe and he's stuffing a sandwich in his, in his mouth and he's changing his clothes on the way there to go preach the word of God. That's, that was Brother Parker. That, that's who he was. He wanted to go out and do that. And, and so this morning what uh, we have done is we wanted to do something to remind us of his memory, but also more than just his memory to remind us of his testimony. To never forget what this church was built upon. Our church is built upon Jesus Christ. That's what the church is built upon. And that was Brother Parker's focus through it all. But it's also good for us to remember those who have gone before us who have helped to lay the foundation. And so we, we uh, put together a, uh, a, a portrait here of Brother and Mrs. Parker because we know every man of God who stands up here, he's got to have a, a, a faithful lady of God who's standing behind and being his cheerleader. And there was no greater cheerleader than Mrs. Parker uh, for Brother Parker. And so this morning we got a portrait. We're going to find a place here to put it. Uh, Brother Lucas is working on us uh, to have a display as well uh, for us uh, to display his Bible and some other things like that, just as reminders of what he was all about. And so that's what this is up here this morning is this here. So we'll have this somewhere, like I said, in the building. And so that's the way I remember him. <laughs> um, full of life and vigor and just serving the Lord. And so that'll be displayed here in our building uh, somewhere with, and just a reminder of, let's not forget those who've gone before us. And uh, this, was our, this was our pastor. Uh, this is the one who invested in our lives. And so I wanted to do that this morning. And, and in, in part of that, Jeff and Cheryl and Patty always sang uh, for him. And so I asked them if they would sing this morning for us as well uh, to come and be a part of this here. And just whatever, whatever they want to want to sing, I, it'll be perfect, I know. Uh, but I, I always loved reunion time. Um, for me, it was Christmas Eve. We'd be down in that basement, and there's nobody who can make food like the Parkers. And we would just stuff ourselves, and then we'd come up here and... Brother Parker would say a few words, do you know, do his thing, and then Cheryl would come over on the on the piano, and and and, uh, and Jeff and and Patty would sing, and then Brother Parker would join in and sing, and then yeah. before you knew it, the whole entire it was just our family, and it was awesome, it was wonderful, and so those are my memories, and so I'm going to ask uh, Brother Jeff and uh, Miss Patty and uh, Miss Cheryl if you guys will come and uh, and sing for us, and after they're done, Brother Rodney, you just come on up and uh, and you preach for us. This little song we're going to sing puts all the emphasis where it really needs to be, and that's on Jesus.
Can you raise it up, Cheryl? Can you raise it up one? And we'll yeah. go up again, right? Yeah, yeah. We need to raise it up again. I know. Which could tell a story of how he brought us here and gave us hope and banished all our fears. But from our many differences, His love has made us one. This song we sing has only just Take your Bibles and turn with me to Mark chapter 14 if you're able to. And this morning, if you're able to stand, if you would please, for the reading of God's Word. You know, there's a lot of things, uh, we see a lot of things that are broken in this world. We see a lot of hearts broken, we see a lot of heartache in people's lives and their homes and different ones. You know, I know the family and the church is, has a broken heart over the loss of Brother Parker. But I want to show you something this morning. God uses broken things. There's always a reason. Mark chapter 14, we begin reading verse 1, says, After two days was the feast of the Passover and of the unleavened bread. 
The chief priest and the scribes sought out how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, not on the feast day. Lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he sat at meat, and there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, a spikenard, very, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with ye always. And whensoever ye will, ye may do to them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever the, this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for memorial to her. We're looking at Memorial Day. We see another memorial here in the scriptures. You see something that took place here. In verse 3 it says that she broke the box and poured it on his head. Some said this is a waste. But even today, on Memorial Day, we're reading about this lady that's used something that was broken for the honor and glory of God. God has something special for every broken thing in your life. God uses broken things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for the mercies of God. We thank you for the blessings that you have reached far beyond that we could ever understand or know. And Lord, today there's still heavy hearts we understand. Memorial Day, the things that's taken place. Lord, we don't understand it all. But Lord, we know that you use broken things. And so, Lord, I pray now that you would use even this old broken, crooked stick this morning. That I might lift you up before the others, that they might know you, that they might see you. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. They murmured against this woman and complained and because of the broken alabaster box. In fact, if you was to go to Matthew 26, verse 8 says, But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? And yet today, could I say that there, with all the brokenness of, uh, on Memorial Day, and when we begin to think about the brokenness in this world today, God still uses broken things. Probably one of the greatest things that happens in our lives, to be honest with you, we don't like it, but probably one of the greatest things that happens in our lives is when God breaks us so that He can use us to our fullest extent. You could have taken that alabaster box, you could have laid it on the table. It was full of the ointment, but it was impossible to get to the ointment that was there unless you broke the box. This morning, God looks across this congregation and He sees people who have been through difficulties and struggles and there's a brokenness. But can I tell you, from that brokenness comes the sweet smell that anointed our Savior Jesus Christ to His bearing. That people might know one day that this woman even, that she broke that box thinking, more about him than she thought about herself. The Bible says that that box could, of ointment could have been sold for over 300 pence, which would have been a, a small fortune to that lady. And yet she did what she, he, she could. He said she, this is all that she could do, and this is what she did what she could. We're not all exactly the same, don't all have exactly the same gifts or the same abilities, but you know what? We can do what God has allowed us to do. And God's wanting to use you and He wants to use me and He wants to use each person in here. 
So I want to direct your minds this morning to that thought today, the Lord uses broken things. As I said, consider that box that was broken. It was, it was, it was something that was precious to her and something that, that people looked at and thought that it was a waste, but it wasn't. Jesus himself said, she in verse 6 said, uh, Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work to me, on me. Verse 8 she says, She hath done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. The Lord allowed it for a picture of his death, his burial, his resurrection, that they might see the importance of why he came. And each of us in our lives, God wants to take, and many times he has to break to get to the precious ointment that's within us that others might know and they might see Jesus Christ in your life and in my life. You can't put that box back together. That alabaster box, when it was broken, it wasn't something that would be broken. They put back together and refilled. It was broken, and then the ointment was poured out. It was a, it was a great breaking. It was a, and and they, that's why they said, why should, there's a great waste here. No, never a waste. The difficulties that you go through, the struggles you go through, and the heartaches that you go through, and God allows it. Because it's a great work. Because He's going to use you in somebody else's life. He's going to use you that others might see Jesus Christ. I look at this picture, Brother Jeff, and yeah, and I think about how God used him in my life. Wasn't raised in a Christian home. Mom and Dad never went to church with us. Brother Parker knew that and he worked in my life. But I think about the lives of the hundreds and thousands that he's touched. But I'm going to be honest with you. It, well, he didn't do it and, it and his whole purpose wasn't for a picture or for him to be exalted. It's the same thing that the lady did. She didn't do it so that her that it would be recognized in the Word of God one day and be a memorial unto her, but it would be a memorial unto Jesus Christ and who He is. And every single one of us today, the reason the brokenness comes is so that Jesus Christ might be lifted up. That he might be glorified. That people would look unto him, not unto, the, not unto the one that poured it out. But my friend, he wants you and me to pour our lives out. But many times we have to be broken to get to that precious ointment in our lives. And he wants this morning to take you and he wants to take me. And he wants to pour us out upon this old world that they might see Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary. And when he went to Calvary and died for you and me and rose again on the third day. Amen. Oh, how he loved us. God uses broken things. God broke my heart one day, and I was talking with Tim Bridges yesterday and his dad I, when I was in high school. And, and uh, I remember going into, the, I was lost, and uh, I was going to church. I was in church, but I was lost. And Brother Bridges was going to the same church I was going to, and, and he was my algebra teacher. And I remember walking in one morning, and uh, real early in the morning, usually you stood out in the halls and, and talked with your friends and everything. And I was under so much conviction. I took my algebra book, first, uh, first hour class, I walked upstairs, went in there, and I thought, maybe I'll talk to him. Maybe he can tell me about getting saved. I walked and put my books on that back row where my, I sit. And I looked up there. He was writing on the chalkboard. And he turned around. He said, Roddy, can I help you with something? And I stared at him for a moment. And he looked at me. I said, no. I just brought my books up. And I think about another time. I remember thinking about, boy, if I die uh, without Jesus Christ, I'm going to split hell wide open. I remember laying in that mobile home with those limbs slapping against that mobile home in the storms and thinking, if I die, the tree comes crashing down this mobile home and kills me, I'm going into hell. I remember sitting in a service and, and wanting to get up and go forward and receive Christ as my Savior. But I couldn't because I had my friends, my teenage friends sitting there, and I thought, what will they say? They think I'm saved. 
I remember standing at one point in the back row on this side and a lady turned around to me during the invitation. I was under conviction and, and she said, would you like to go forward to get saved? And I can still remember. I bet my heart from there was going like this because I could just, I thought she probably sees my shirt moving. <laughs> under conviction. In the middle of May on a Wednesday night in 1975, sitting back on this side over here again with my teenage friends, I remember saying in my mind, I'm not going to hell for nobody. Getting up over on that side, and before I hit that altar, I'd already received Christ as my Savior. Broken things. He had to break my pride. It had to break me down to where I was willing to do whatever He wanted so that I would pour my heart and life out to Him that, that I could receive Him as my Savior. This morning you may not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, but my friend, He can put you on the bottom. He can break you down, whatever He has to do to get you to a place where you receive Him as your Savior. He wants you to come unto Him. You've got to break that pride. You've got to turn loose of yourself in order that you might receive Him as your Savior. Consider also not the broken box, but also consider the broken bread as He fed the 5,000, as he, as he cared for others. He blessed and He broke the bread that we find there in Matthew chapter 14. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took five loaves and, and two fishes and looked up to heaven. And He blessed and He broke and gave the loaves of, uh, to His disciples and disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat uh, and were filled and were took up to the fragments and remained 12 basketfuls. And they, and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. Do you realize that when the Lord uh, does something, many times He breaks it before He blesses it. Before He does great and mighty things, He has to break it. He broke that bread. He broke those fishes. And He blessed them then. And He fed the 5,000. Why did He have to break? I, I, I'm going to tell you something. It, it would have been no problem for the Lord to just took those five loaves and, and those fishes and just put them in the basket and say, just go feed them. And, and they would have got a whole f a piece of fish and a, a whole fish and a, and a whole piece of bread. But He took it and He broke them. And He blessed them. Why? Because the Lord wants us to realize He's many times we've got to fall into the hands of the Lord and He must break us to get us to where He wanted, not just to, for ourselves, but the 5,000 that's out there, the others that are around, that they might be fed, that they might know about Jesus Christ, that they might come to the Lord, that they might see the hand of God moving and working on something that's been broken. Amen. God wants to move and break in our lives and in our churches and and draw us to him. I, I think about Louis Zamperini. Louis Zamperini was in the in World War II. He was a uh, he, he actually was in the Olympics. He shook hands with Hitler. Wasn't long after that he was fighting him. But he was in the Pacific. He got shot down in the Pacific. And the, on goes the, uh, the story uh, of how his life was. He, Louis Zamperini was a rascal when he was young. And the others had tried to share Jesus Christ with him. His family tried to, to lead him to the Lord. And he was just hard. He was shot down with the South Pacific and he, he was in the South Pacific on, on life raft with some other men that had made it and, and the sharks was tearing up the, the life rafts and on goes the story and how their, their, their lips was pooching out with no, no uh, anything to drink and, and just on goes the story. Finally, uh, he winds up in a Japanese prison camp. There's a man there by the, that they called the bird. And the bird was, was cruel and mean to people. And during that time, uh, he would take men and he would, he would uh, put them outside in their underwear uh, for days at a time in the cold weather. Uh, he is known to, to take people and, and, and just beat them and beat them and beat them and beat them and kill them many times because of the beatings. He was a war criminal. And because Louis Zamperini was a great runner in the Olympics, he had heard about him. He singled him out and he began to torture him. Begin to do different things to Louis Zamperini. Louis Zamperini uh, at one point said, Lord, you, I, I, I just you get me out of here. I, I'll live for you. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And, and I'm not going to go into the whole story what all took place, but Louis Zamperini got out of that prison camp and, and, and made it back home. And, and uh, he got married and, and uh, he began to drink and, and just, uh, just a terrible life and still had never come to a place where he'd received Christ. He woke up one night or one morning, his wife beating on him and trying to scream. He was choking her to death because of the memories and the 
backlashes of all that had taken place. She got him to go to a revival meeting. She didn't tell him what it was. She kind of lied to him to get him there. He got mad at her, and on goes the story. But eventually, Louis Zamperini got to the end of his rope. God broke him, and Louis Zamperini got saved. Louis Zamperini was able to lead others to Christ in his life and tell them what God had done in their hearts and lives, but he had to break him first. Edgar Harrell was in the South Pacific. He, would, he was on the USS Indianapolis. They had just delivered a special payload to an island. The name Fat Boy mean anything to you? Atomic bomb. He was a Marine, but he was on this ship with, and guarding this payload, not knowing what it was. As soon as they unloaded it, they told him to take the U.S. Indianapolis out of there. And in 1945, they sunk that ship. It was torpedoed. Didn't have any destroyers accompanying it. I forget how many. There's a, a thousand some that was on the ship. Only 300 and some survived, but Edgar Harrell survived. He knew Christ as his Savior, but he wasn't living for the Lord. And during that time as he floated in that Pacific Ocean, fighting off the sharks, they would take their, with their, their, their vest, their life preserver vest, they would lean back and they'd put their feet up with one another and try to keep their feet up as much above or towards the, the top of the water so the sharks wouldn't tear their legs off. On and on went this. He watched people drown and just literally take off their life vest and just let go and sink and die. He would have prayer with the different ones. He would encourage them. And during that time, his faith grew. His faith in the Lord. He said, We're going to, the Lord's going to get us out of that. And he kept on and kept on encouraging them. Different ones would drift away in the middle of the night and you wouldn't see them no more. Sometimes you would hear the frenzy of the sharks as they would take a hold of different of the uh, survivors or the different, uh, not survivors, but the different uh, 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 military men that was floating in the water there and destroy them. Finally, a plane spotted them. They didn't even know that the Indianapolis for, for weeks didn't even know that the Indianapolis had even been sunk. During that time, he kept encouraging the others and praying with them and quoting scripture. But he himself grew closer to the Lord. And it was during that time of brokenness that Edgar Harrell really decided to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Broken. Broken. Hundreds of people have been saved because of the testimony of Edgar Harrell. He just died this year. Brokenness. The Lord decides to use that brokenness. Why? To reach others, to touch their lives. We're not here for us. We're here for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're here that He might be exalted, that He might be lifted up. The Lord uses broken things. He used a castaway man that was wandering in the tombs and, and that, uh, that they couldn't tame over in Mark chapter 5. It says they came over into the other side of the sea and into the Gadarenes. When they, he, saw, he was come out of the ship, immediately there met out of him out of the tomb a man with an unclean spirit who had a dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had often been uh, often bound with uh, fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, and neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the, in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he worshipped him. A broken man the difficult life, a struggle in life, and yet when Jesus Christ came to him in his brokenness, after the man had received Christ as his Savior, he wanted to go with him. And Jesus wouldn't allow him to. He says, go back home. Tell them what, they, what the Lord's done for you. Let them see the change in your life. This man was broken. Nobody could tame him. Nobody could fix it. But Jesus Christ, when he came into his life, fixed the man. He used a broken thing to send him back. And I, I'm not going to go back in the scripture and show you, but there was a great revival broke out when Jesus came back. People began to get saved. The woman at the well, and I'm trying to cut through this and shorten this for us this morning. The woman at the well. 
come to, in the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day, when they, the others normally didn't come to, to draw water. She was a broken woman. Her life was a mess. She had had five husbands and was living with a man now. And Jesus came and he began to expound to her and, and share with her. She, he asked of her of water and, and she gave him water. But he said, if you'd asked of me, I'd give you living water. But that broken woman, as Brother Parker used to say, said she left her water pot home, uh, there and she took home the well. Because yes. <laughs> in her life sprang up a, a, a river of living water. A broken woman that you find that she goes back and she tells others and they begin to come and, and see this one called Jesus Christ. Why? Because this broken woman had got fixed and was being used. I don't know what's in your life today. I don't know what you're going to face tomorrow. I don't know what next week holds for any of us. But I'm going to tell you something. There's going to be some brokenness along the way. And along the way, the Lord says, I'll fix and I'll use that brokenness in your life. Not for you as much as it will be for Him. I think back over the years the different things that's taken place in our lives and, and how the Lord used it in my life. I remember at one point uh, many years ago uh, when uh, Kristen was in the hospital, they was doing brain surgery on her. They was going to have to take her brain and move it back up into her skull, take the, the uh, uh, membrane and, and reattach her brain back up into her skull. It went down into around the spinal uh, it was shutting off all the spinal fluid and it was forcing it down through the spinal cord and, and causing her arm to be, be numb and, and no feeling in it and her left leg a little bit the same way and, and she was having migraines and so they went in there and, and used that. But during that time when we were standing there while they was waiting, while we was waiting on them while they was operating on her, they sent my mom home. They called me and said, we're sending your mom home. She's got two weeks to live. It's during that time, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know what God said? I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to take care of it. And sometimes He uses those broken things in our lives to help us to step closer to Him. And the reason He wants us to step closer to Him is so that He can use us in the lives of those around us. My friend, this morning, it's not time to quit when you, things become broken. It's time to Say, God, how do you want to use me? Yeah. Lord, take me and use me. Take me and use me that you might be glorified. And, Lord, I don't have much, but what I have and, and what I am, Lord, I want you to take me and use me. Sometimes he breaks our heart. The psalmist said, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and, a, and save such as of a contrite spirit. And sometimes our hearts get broken deeply and hurt. It's hard to, to get past it sometimes. But you know what the Lord looks down and He says, I like a broken heart. I like a heart that I can use. Matthew tells us in Matthew 3 and 4, He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for, they, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And oh, how He desires for us to come to that place where we're willing for Him to break us. The Bible tells us in Psalms 51, 17, as we, we know the prayer of David here as he's, as he's praying, and he says, The sacrifices of, of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, O God, Thou will not despise. As much as sometimes that we want to just shout and glorify God and, and run the aisles, and I'll be honest with you, that's what I like doing, amen. I, I like to just praise God and go on. Sometimes he says, you know what? There's got to be a little brokenness. Yeah. Why, God? He said, I've been investing in your life. I've been putting things in your life. I've been preparing you. I've been working in your life. I've been putting people in your life. I've been putting the Word of God in your life. I've put people across your path. I've put preachers in your life. I've given you this. I've given you that. I've done this. Now it's time that I break it and pour it out. Folks, we're living in these last days. I really think we're living in the last hours, if you want to put it that way. It's ticking up. 
We're seeing some difficult times and struggles in, in this world, and it's, it's going to get worse. I'm not trying to be negative, but it's going to get worse by looking at it from that standpoint. But can I tell you, that's really, it's getting better. What do you mean, preacher, getting better? Oh, yeah, getting closer. And there's going to be difficulties. There's going to be struggles. And everyone that's sitting in this church, people have, the, the preacher and, and, and Brother Parker and, and, and Brother Wilson, they've been pouring into you. Your Sunday school teachers, they've been pouring into you. And, and your moms and dads have been pouring into you. And brothers and sisters in Christ have been pouring into you. It may be that it's time to, for that box to be broken and to pour you out that you can reach others for Jesus Christ. we got to pull the stops out, folks. It's, time is coming. we got to get the gospel out. we got to get people in that they might know Jesus Christ is saved, but it'll never happen until that brokenness comes and we pour our lives out into other people that they might know our Savior. That's what she did. She anointed him. He said that she would be a memorial that people would know what she did. Not just remembering her but not remind, remind, reminding them of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh my soul. People ought to look at your life as you're broken and they say, I don't understand it. How can they be broken like that and still go on and serve God? How can they be broken like that and have joy in their heart? Heart. How can they be broken like that and say that they love God? How can they do it? And my friend, pour out yourself unto somebody. Pour out yourself before the Lord. Lift him up and magnify him. Amen. Oh, how he loves us. Broken and poured out. I took about a 45 minute message and chopped it in about 15. But I don't think I have to. As I look across this crowd, and you know what I think? I just want to say, yeah, there's brokenness. But the reason God allowed the brokenness, it's because it's your time. It's your time to be poured out. So much has been put in, but now it's time to be poured out. Great and mighty things when God breaks the box and pours us out. You can be stubborn. I can be stubborn. Say, Lord, I'm not going to allow the brokenness. I'm going to be tough. You can allow him to use his hands to break, or he can use a hammer. I'd, I'd much rather him take his hands, those loving hands, those nail scarred hands, and reach down and break that heart with his hands, as for him to have to use a hammer. God uses broken things. Over the years, God's used different people in my life that the brokenness. One of the dear ladies that was here years ago, Myra Vavak, sit in a chair back there about where Jeff and Dale and him were a lot of times. She'd sit in her wheelchair, but sometimes on this side. For those of you that didn't know Myra Vavak, she was had crippling arthritis and everything, every day, every time was pain. Brother Parker would get up and preach. They fixed her a little stick, had a rubber band on it. Had a handkerchief on it. And my Vavac, I knew it had to hurt every time she moved. And she'd praise God. Yeah. Broken in body, but not broken in spirit. Right. Cheering her preacher on. Cheering on the one that her preacher was preaching about. <coughs> broken. You say, How, what can a, a little lady in a wheelchair do for you, preacher? Preacher. 
I went into evangelism. She t told me one day, she said, give me a list of where you're preaching. I'd give it to her. She said, I can't sleep, but 30 minutes or so at a time. She said, I'll be praying for you. I'd come back and she'd say, meeting good? I said, Meyer, thank you for praying. I asked 14 saved. Come back. How was meeting? Good. Had five saved. Come back. How'd it go? It was good. God called some people into the ministry. God used a little lady in a wheelchair and a handkerchief in prayer. Doing what she could. She was broken. But God used her. He said, Preacher, you don't know what's happened in my life. You just don't know what I've done. Don't have to. <laughs> God uses broken things. He said, Preacher, I don't think I can get saved. You don't, know, you don't know what my life was like. Don't have to know what your life was like. God delights in saving broken people. God uses broken things. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for the mercies of God. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings and kindness to us now. Lord, it's a special day. It's a memorial day. Unveiling of the portrait and different things. But it's a day that we want to point people to Jesus Christ. A day that there's some maybe sitting here that there's brokenness. Lord, would you help them? Would you pull them up close and say it's not time to quit? It's not time to step aside. It's time to pour out. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, we're living in these last days. Help us, each of us, to allow you to break us and pour us out for your honor and glory. Lord, for someone who doesn't know Christ their Savior, Lord, I pray they'd come this morning. I know I didn't preach a salvation message, but I don't think I had to. I think the Spirit of God will convict and draw. And Lord, I pray that you call them that they might be saved. Lord, may they come and receive Christ. Have your will and way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.